All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome once again to another episode of the Remarkable Coach Podcast. I am always, uh, as always, I'm your host, Marco Pacheco. Uh, today with me, I have Paul Glover. Paul is the no BS uh, workforce legacy coach, a recovering trial lawyer, an ex-felon, the author of Workquake, a presenter on creating leadership legacy and having a fool in your life, and a member of the Forbes Coaching Council. Uh, Paul, welcome to the podcast. Michael, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be with you and to be able to talk to you and your audience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time here. Um, I always like to open up the podcast by simply inviting our guests to Tell us a little bit about yourself, um, a little bit about your story, and what got you into coaching. Well, I, you've you've taken my bio and pretty much told the story. Uh, recovering lawyer, I practiced law uh, in federal court, employment and labor law for 30 years. And uh, because I was a bad guy wannabe, I associated with bad guys. And over a period of time, that caught up with me. And I was indicted on 33 counts of violations of uh, kickbacks and taking bribes and uh, tampering with government witnesses. And at the end of my second trial, I went to prison for uh, seven years. Uh, case to the Supreme Court and had my sentence reduced so that I was out in five and a half years. By, by the way, still guilty, just to reduce sentence. I uh, got out and uh, had to make some serious uh, career decisions. I was never going to be able to practice law again, being a convicted felon. And I looked at the skill sets that I developed, both as a lawyer uh, and uh, and one reflection in prison. Uh, I decided that uh, that my my expertise as a critical thinker, a persuasive storyteller, because a successful lawyer practicing uh, in federal court needs to be able to tell uh, take the jury on a uh, a journey. Uh, and so I took the persuasive storytelling and. Also, the, uh, the reality that most leaders needed a lesson in humility that I was in a position to give them. And so I uh, got out of prison and started a coaching practice. And I've been uh, been a uh, executive C-suite coach now since 2001 when I got out of prison. And now I have a national coaching practice that uh, concentrates on leadership who is who are developing a legacy. That's great. That's great. How did you how did you make that transition into specifically executive and C-suite coaching? Well, I, first, uh, because of, again, that the, the mix of of being a critical thinker, which most uh, C-suite executives enjoy, they always they believe that they are uh, they are rational animals uh, who uh, who uh, who are able to dictate logically uh, from a critical thinking perspective, and uh, that is true. It's a part of the skill set. I already had that one down. Being a lawyer, I was trained in critical thinking, uh, but I also realized that the emotional aspect is where leadership flourishes. And I put together a coaching package based on the combination of those two skill sets of emotional intelligence and critical thinking. Because at that time, going back 20 years, uh, emotional intelligence was talked about what wasn't practiced. Mm -hmm. As I started to talk to leaders marketing myself as an executive coach, uh, I uh, emphasize that, and uh, I, I can tell you that first, uh, eighty percent of all coach of all the clients who are referred to me, potential clients, uh, never become clients because they don't appreciate my approach. And the approach is no bullshit. And second, it is going to be a combination of critical thinking and emotional intelligence. And if you don't believe you need those skill sets, then you need to find someone else. So it basically was a trial and error, but I also was very, uh, very succinct about what I was willing to do. I'd already gone to prison, so I recognized that my legacy was going to be built through helping other leaders create their legacy. Mm -hmm. And that that's how I approached it. So it was a longer term perspective. So when someone came to me and said, I really want to get better at public speaking, I, I would say, well, that's something we can work on, but only in the context of, of legacy. Uh -huh. 
for those who said, well, I, I'm not interested in that, it would be, okay, find somebody else. I mean, that's because I'm not willing to waste my time or their money on nothing less than creating a lasting legacy based on the skill sets and the interaction those skill sets allow for you to build a legacy. That makes sense. Sometimes I babble. No, completely. I love that. I love that your, your, your clarity going into that, knowing that you're looking for second and third order effects from what you do. Absolutely. And, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, uh, the, the concept of legacy, by the way, is based on being bold. Uh -huh. Because otherwise, I don't understand why you would think you would have a legacy worth leaving. Uh, so, so, and it's interesting to me how many leaders are, are timid. Mm -hmm. uh, first, the, the hardest person for me to coach is someone who's successful because they have an itch to get better, but they're not willing to commit to the work necessary to change. Because that's when we talk about improvement, we're talking about change for most people. Because once they've got to the C suite, they've established themselves as, as having skills. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is that they've, they also feel that itch that says, I could be doing better. My organization could be doing better, but I'm not really sure what that means right now. Once you tell them or once you explain to them the level of commitment needed to engage in transformation and change, a lot of them just back off. They're like mm, doing well enough the way it is. OK, uh, but remember that once you do that, you've pretty much said I've reached my potential. And the reality is most people have not. The opportunity for leaders to actually show that they do have greater potential to be better and for their organization to get better is there, but it's unexplored. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. You 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 mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, as you started talking about this, that that these executives and and people in the C-suite, they and I think you put specific emphasis on they believe that they are rational animals. Is that not your experience? Of course not. Uh, we're, we're not rational animals. We, we are emotional animals who pretend uh, to be able to justify our decision making and choices with rationality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First, we have too many blind spots to be, uh, to, to be rational. Our blind spots are exactly that. They're built into our personality. Uh, and we, we don't even know they exist because they're blind spots. Uh, that a coach is obligated to be that, to give that leader the gift of truth, which is to show them their blind spots and also make sure they're aware of their triggers. Mm -hmm. the, the trigger is that word, that action, that, that whatever it may be, that suddenly makes that blind, that activates the blind spot. Once the blind spot's activated, you make bad decisions, mm -hmm. you make bad choices. So because of that, I, looked at, I look at human beings as basically being emotional uh, and therefore having to understand how that factors into your decision making, the choices that you make, and stop, stop bullshitting people about the fact you're, you're not. Uh, the concept of being professional is how, we, how leaders hide. Mm -hmm. Hey, right, they go. I, well, I'm a professional, therefore I can't show authenticity. Right, show vulnerability. I can never say I don't know, <laughs> and I can never ask someone else for information I don't have. Mm -hmm. but that's just crazy to me that you would think that that was going to work. And I would suggest that today's leaders need to understand that the skill set is completely different. Mm -hmm. The, the concepts of professional and personal are now completely integrated because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. As I hate the pandemic, it has caused leadership to be looked at in a different way. So when we start looking at the, the traits that will make a successful leader today, they have very little to do with the traits that would make someone a leader pre-pandemic. I'll give you a couple of them. The first thing is you have to be perpetually curious. If you're not, if you're not asking the right questions, trouble is coming for you. And it's out there. I tell people one of the one of my in my the leaders that are in my coaching program, you need to always be looking for trouble. And the way you do that is you ask the right questions of the right people. 
the right people are not those people in the executive suite because they will filter the information so you hear what you want to hear. Remember those blind spots? So many people see our blind spots and we don't. So what happens, of course, is those that want something will learn how to manipulate us through our blind spots. Mm -hmm. They will trigger us to react or act in a fashion that we want them to be so that we get what we want, not necessarily what they want. Uh, so the way you escape is you get out of that filter and you go to the front line. I'm sorry, you go and say. Let's say so I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. If, as a high powered executive, how do you how do you cut through the bullshit, right? Because you're probably surrounded by it. You're surrounded by people who are trying to glad hand you, who are trying to shine your shoes and blow smoke up your ass and whatever yeah. other, whatever other colorful uh, metaphors you want to come up with. But how do you sure. cut through that and, and really get to the, the truth of really whatever it is you want to get to the truth of? Well, and, and I, I think that everyone, you know, everybody wants to believe that their organization is doing the best it can, uh, right, and is not doing bad things, uh, is efficient and effective. Uh, and we hear that all the time because guess what? The numbers look good. Mm -hmm. And first, I tell every executive, if you're looking at a spreadsheet, remember that behind every number is a face. Mm -hmm. That, that number just didn't come out of, you know, it, it didn't just appear. Someone created that number. Someone that you need to go talk to. Mm -hmm. the, the reality is that I love, I especially love companies that have third shifts because whatever's going wrong with that company is going wrong on the third shift. Mm -hmm. And if you are the leader, you need to go to the third shift. And it's interesting when I suggest that to leaders, they're, they're like deer in a headlight. Because one of the questions is, you have a third shift, when was the last time you visited? Crickets. Because that would mean you had to get your lazy ass up at midnight right. and, go, and go there. So my contention is, uh, is and I give people tasks. Uh, if you want to be in my coaching program, we, you have tasks, you have things you have to do that show you're committed to this process. And if you have a third shift, one of your tasks is to get up and go there for the lunch break mm -hmm. four in the morning. You're not to take anyone with you and you're not to tell anybody you're going mm -hmm. Just show up. By the way, I tell them the first time, go in the lunchroom, set out. The first time that happens, they're going to call the police because they have no idea who you are. There's an intruder in the lunchroom. <laughs> and believe me, this is this is true. I mean, this is the way it is. The third time you show up is when you've shown the guy who's working the third shift or person that you're serious about wanting to find out their opinion. Right. And that's when you hear the truth. That's when the truth comes to you unfiltered. Yeah. Those are those are opportunities that every leader has, but few take. Because there's there, there's a few good men. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> the second part of this caveat is once you know the truth, you have to do something about it. Right. Otherwise, don't go back to the third shift. No one's ever going to talk to you again. Why would they? You ask for their, their gift of truth. They give it to you, and then you do nothing with it. Well, don't go back. Nobody wants to hear your bullshit anymore because that's all it is. So the deal is you've got to be prepared for the truth. Shockingly, most leaders don't want the truth. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is a coaching relationship, by the way. That's a deal breaker for me. Yeah. So I'm I'm getting I'm getting some some vibes about tough love from you, but you also used a word, you also used a word early on, the big V word that we all know and love, vulnerability. You are a convicted felon. You talk about this. It's not a secret. What, how, what, what, how does vulnerability play into your work? Well, first, the, the, the concept of vulnerability is about, if you're going to have a meaningful coaching relationship, by, by the way, if you're going to have a meaningful relationship, it's based on trust. That's the bedrock. 
So we have to establish a level of trust with each other before we can we can have a meaningful interaction. Because every coaching opportunity is an interaction with another person to it, from my perspective, to achieve something, to, to find out something, to do the exploration necessary to be able to say, here's an action plan that allows you to implement a different skill set, a different approach, and, and show improvement and show operational improvement. So the concept is, I'm going to be honest with you, you're going to have to be honest with me. Well, we will share that vulnerability because it now allows us to do the hard work together. Mm -hmm. And one of my clients refers to me as a Sherpa. He said, he said, Paul will take you to the top of the mountain, but he won't carry your pack. Uh -huh. And and that's our deal, right? We're going to find out what your pack is, and you're going to have to carry that pack. Now, you can unload it as you go, but you have to be able to do it in a fashion that shows improvement. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and the relationship develops, and it is a mix of professionalism and personal. Uh, you've got to be personal in a coaching relationship because I will shift from being a coach to being a consultant if I see you're going down for the third time. Mm -hmm. I, I will not let someone drown because I know the answer. And I, by the way, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not going to lead you to the answer while you lay on a couch. You're engaged in day-to-day -day hostility, aren't you? I mean, this is the, the business world is all about, you're surrounded by hostility, by chaos, by the pandemic, uncertainty, the black swan event. The last thing you need is for, for you to tell me that you have a problem and you have thought about this, we'll have that discussion, right? But mm -hmm. it's something, when it's apparent to me, you don't know the answer, I will tell you a potential answer. Here is something you need to consider. Mm -hmm. that, that to me is a part of the relationship based on trust. I've got experience that I'm bringing to the coaching process. If I don't share it, what the hell good am I? Yeah. Reality is we work together as a team. We develop an action plan. At the very beginning of the coaching process, you tell me what you want to achieve. I will tell you first whether or not I think that's achievable because some things aren't right just because you want to play forward for the Chicago Bulls and you're five foot two and don't have a jump shot. I really don't believe that that should be your goal. So, so be realistic about this or it's not going to work, you know, so it's about you tell me what you want. I'm going to help you do it. I'm, gonna, I'm like, no, no, you tell me that, that what you want to do makes sense and then we'll do it. That type of honest conversation disappears the farther up the ladder, the hierarchy you go. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. By the way, everybody agrees. Look, I, it's so interesting to me how we all know the verbiage. Uh huh. If I talk to a person and I go, say, what do you think about uh, empathy? Oh, hell yeah. Uh, all about that. Uh, by, by the way, my, my organization, that's what it's built on, trust and empathy. I go, hmm, okay, uh, is it all right if we do a 360 degree review? Show me, show me, show me. Exactly, that it's <laughs> exactly, because the reality is I know what you think, but I want to know reality, and I'm not going to get that from you. I was a uh, practicing trial attorney. I never expected my client to tell me the truth. Uh -huh. Never happened. Why? Well, first, they want me to like them. They somehow believe that was going to, to have an impact on the level of representation they were going to get at court. Mm -hmm. The reality is, I, don't, I, I didn't have to like you. In fact, most of the time, I wouldn't like you. But the reality is that the obligation is to, is to still do the representation part. Mm -hmm. So I don't expect to hear the truth. I didn't expect to hear it from my clients when we were in court. And I certainly don't expect to hear it from the leader. I get the truth about the leader from his team. Mm -hmm. sure. And what we get to do then is, because I'm, a, I'm a, a staunch advocate of a 360 degree review. And we have the leader take the 360 self-evaluation. Mm -hmm. Then I send out the 360 to the team, whoever that may be. They send it back to me. I do the compilation. And then guess what we do? We compare the two. You look for alignment or, or misalignment. <laughs> Absolutely. Now we start to see the truth. 
It starts to, it's, it comes further and further apart. It does. I love it. I, listen, the, the one that always kills the leader immediately, just really f freaks them out, is they will rate themselves on a scale of one to five with communication. They'll give themselves a five. Yeah. And the communicate. Everyone understands exactly what I say. Well, you know what? We get it back. You know what you are? You're a two. <laughs> Because you believe that telepathy is communication. Mm -hmm. And so that's how you're communicating. That starts, at, that, that actually is always the best category to start to work on. Yeah. Make you a better communicator and everything else gets easy. But recognize you have to get better because you're terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, well, Paul, what does what typical engagement with you look like? What length? What? Yeah, uh, what just yeah. Do you do like a three month package, a six month oh. package, month by month? Do you do one to one coaching, group coaching? Twelve months. Okay. Twelve months. I I have learned through twenty years of doing this that if we're not hanging out for twelve months, mm -hmm. we're not gonna we're not going to achieve. By the way, I understand the concept now. These these are big bold goals. I don't want to waste my time or the client's money with little goals. It's like, okay, tell me what you want to achieve, really achieve. And that's why we talk about legacy. Mm -hmm. because, because I'm not, the day-to-day -day we'll talk about, because obviously I'm not going to ignore the fact that if you're having issues that you want to discuss, that's a part of the gig, right? That's mm -hmm. like you have a scheduled every other week, 30 to 60 minute session. And at the beginning, somebody will say, well, that's just too much. Okay, your life is so boring that shit's not happening on a daily basis that you're having issues with. Well, then, then I don't, I'm not sure if you're actually in charge of anything. So <laughs> we, we established the cadence, and there's also calls in between. If you're having a particular bad situation, whatever that might be, you can call. But otherwise, we're going to spend 30 to 60 minutes every other week talking about whatever issues you want to talk about. But then we're going to move to legacy because I want to know what you're doing once we've established the definition of your legacy. That means that you have to push yourself five or 10 years out. Mm -hmm. And that is a shocking revelation to most leaders. They are so present in the moment that they can't, they're, they're just not thinking about that. It's not, not a conversation anyone's ever said to them. Mm -hmm. So we start immediately talking about succession. That freaks them out too. Oh my God, somebody's going to replace. <laughs> yeah, or oh, somebody's going to replace. By the way, the, the reason the people don't, a majority of Americans don't have a will. Mm -hmm. You know why? They fear death. <laughs> they don't think they're ever going to die. Right? <laughs> yeah, they're afraid that if they actually have a will, it will cause them to die. I mean, right. it's seriously connected so psychologically. Leaders are the same way when it comes to succession. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your succession plan. The first thing is, are they going to try to get rid of me? I mean, I, I, what, what are you talking about? No, but, but legacy is about handing off, mm -hmm. right? Creating something of value that you hand off to someone else because eventually, and I, and I believe 10 years is the max, by the way, for, for C-suites. Mm -hmm. I think that at that time you become a retread. Mm -hmm. that, that you're not having new ideas. That, that you're not responding appropriately for a very quick moving uh, business, in fact, chaotic environment. Sure. I mean, that's where we're at, isn't it? Things are moving so fast that it's difficult to believe that you could keep up for 10 years. I have, of course, I have, I have CEOs who say, screw you. I'm like, okay, all I'm telling you is 10 years from now, you better, you better still have an A game. Yeah. I talk about fast moving and chaotic, the pictures of those waves behind you. Those are, yes. those are there and they, and they, and they disappear in an instant. And they do. And they come and they keep coming. Right. Yeah. One thing about waves is it's constant. And anyone who believes that we've worked our way through all of the, all of the, I've got my book is named work quick. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, that is, after an earthquake, the environment is changed. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're at right now. And it's not going to be the last work quick, believe me. We're just starting. Uh, the, the, the pandemic, if nothing else, 
it, it broke the fallacies about work for a lot of people. And it also broke the fallacy about leadership. And I started talking about, excuse me, talking about some of the uh, some of the traits. Another trait is you better be an empathetic listener. Active listening used to be the deal, not good enough anymore. Why? The personal aspect of it. Empathy is all about being personal. The interesting thing about empathy is once you have it, you have to couple it with something else, and that's compassion. Empathy is I now have walked, and we always do the walked in your shoes for a mile. Uh, and understand your journey. Well, that's cool. Now, what are you going to do about it? Once again, that's compassion. When you say we will make these changes so your journey is easier. Mm -hmm. uh, compassion is something that if you talk to people prior pre pandemic five years ago, they would have said that's crazy. We can't know. You know, we pay them. <laughs> well, geez, aren't you aren't you magnanimous? Uh, yeah, now, now we suddenly are faced with a workforce who've said, this is not good enough. The great resignation is all about work not being good enough. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, guess what? Do what you have to do to make it better. If you want to operate, you want to keep people, uh, you need to make sure that it's better. Uh, another thing is humor. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting you be a stand up comedian, but I also believe that people are when when they see that grim face leader. Right, you, you don't even want to talk to that guy mm -hmm. or woman when they walk in and they've got that face of stone, you know that this is not going to be a good day right well often leaders absolutely adopt that well there's actually a phrase for it. resting. Bitch face. <laughs> RBF. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And and I it shocks me how many leaders believe of both <laughs> genders. That's your look. I'm like, why? And would you like to have people actually interact with you as a human being? Well, of course. I need well then you've got to change that demeanor. Mm -hmm. have to actually smile. Oh my God. And by the way, I actually have some readers who have to practice. You know how you practice a smile? You put a pencil right there. <laughs> you do, and you have. <laughs> there we go. See, we start. We're starting to change. And so I, that that's the deal is that you've got to you've got to change the way you interact. Another thing prior to the pandemic that I strongly recommended was you had to take an improv class. I love that. That's great. Oh, that's great. You the the concept. My wife and I took one together. Yeah. And this, this was what convinced me. Uh, because my wife is a giver, I'm a taker. Mm -hmm. and she did so well in the improv, and it's creative and innovative, but you have to get used to giving, right? You've got to hand off. And I was like, this is something that leaders have to practice because they don't know how to do it. They, 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 they're not sure they can, but second, they're not even predisposed. Improvisation is huge for leaders. Improv is based upon the premise of yes and. Exactly. Right. And so you're always you're always in agreement. You're always working together with someone and you build upon it. Yep. And you never know where it's going to go. Yeah. Right? I mean, the improv to me was was shocking in, in how it could take a sharp right and be someplace else in that giving. Right. It would be like, the hell did that happen? Ah, see, that's really good for leaders. And then and then what do you have to do? You have to say yes and. <laughs> exactly. You can't say, no, I'm not going to do that. You have to go with it, right? Which is well, just exactly how it is, isn't it? That, that's how, that's where we're at today. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that. I'm not going to do it. It's like, who said you had a choice? Mm -hmm. A choice? This is not something you can control. Go with it. Believe me, though, that's the type of changing a mindset that's spectacular for leaders who adopt it. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Yeah, do, do an improv. I love that. That's great. I got a couple of other things that, I, that I'll be done. Uh, first, you have to be a persuasive communicator. Mm -hmm. If you're a good storyteller, get out of the leadership position because you can, once again, we're back to the facts versus the story. Yep. The story is a narrative that is wrapped around 
facts, but it addresses the need for human connection. The first two trials that I had, I lost, jury trials. And there was a, uh, a veteran uh, lawyer in the, uh, in the audience, uh, and he said, look, for the price of a steak dinner, I'll tell you what you're doing wrong. I was like, sure. And by the way, the steak dinner was okay, but the bottle of scotch he drank about bankrupt me. So, <laughs> so he goes, he goes, look, you're really fantastic at giving them the fact. Unfortunately, where's your story? I was like, what do you mean? He said, you need the narrative. Stories and change opinions. Stories bring stories inside emotion. Yeah. That you're spot on with this. And and so I immediately adopted Joseph Campbell's hero's journey approach. Right? My client was going to be the hero of a narrative that I was going to present to the to the jury, but I would invited them to take the journey with us. Mm -hmm. Of course, there, the, the, the concept of a hero's journey is there has to be adversary, mm -hmm. right? I mean, otherwise, Little Red Riding Hood is just a pleasant walk in the woods without the wolf. Sure. I have the wolf. So there was always a, an adversity that I could connect my client to and make him the hero. Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that is required for leadership now because you need to invite people along the journey with you and and that creates purpose so how does how does a leader practice storytelling i first he and i if i if you're in if you're in my coaching program we're going to practice storytelling we're going to pick a topic that you say i need to communicate this to the workforce mm -hmm going to talk about how you're going to do that and you're going to put together your narrative and and it's this is not difficult I mean obviously it's difficult if you don't want to do it but if you say okay because the problem the point is and the problem you now have to be often often excuse me authentic and vulnerable otherwise nobody believes your story so so that's where we have to break it down and we break it down by practice so you get your story and you practice it uh, for instance, the, the best example of this is TED, TEDx Talks. Mm -hmm. TEDx Talk, we watch for a couple of reasons. Maybe it's new information, interesting idea, but it's the person who's telling us about this that we want to connect with. And we don't connect just because they say, let me tell you the statistics about mm -hmm. what it is. We connect because this person says, I'm a, I'm a part of this, and these statistics matter because I experienced them. For instance, I'm doing a TED Talk right now, trying to get a TED Talk, and, and a part of my, my story is my story, right? Because I'm saying, I might, the talk is, everybody needs a fool in their life. That's the person who has the psychological safety to tell you the gift of truth. Mm -hmm. And my deal is, if I'd had one, maybe I wouldn't have gone to prison, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the blind spots that I had and the triggers all were outside my control. And I responded to those triggers and I committed bad acts because of them. Now, if somebody had been there to say, look, I care enough about you to give you, tell you the gift of truth, the people you're hanging around with and the decisions you're making, the choices are going to hurt you and other people. Mm -hmm. And it did. It devastated my clients. It devastated my family. Devastated my community. So, but, but back to this. So we, we need to become authentic. That means our place in the, in the story has got to be one based off of not only the facts, but also the emotion of the journey. Mm -hmm. We're the journey together. Here's our purpose. Here's our why. And together we're going to overcome adversity. And we're going to celebrate victories. And we're going to do this thing together. Mm -hmm. You've got that that level of commitment and engagement because we're always looking at leaders leaders are always looking for engagement sure. why not that's where you actually get discretionary effort you don't get discretionary effort by buying it you have to earn it and so so that's that's how this this starts off and it starts off slow and you develop your story and then you have to keep repeating it and that's maybe the one thing that most leaders balk at. After there's a good story and they've told it for the 40th time, they're bored with it. 
But my deal is you're not the audience, dude. It's still, it's still impactful for all the people that haven't heard it yet. Absolutely. Plus, you need to reinforce the story periodically with what? Here's a new adversary. Yeah. Here's a victory. Let's celebrate. It is, this, is, this, is a, this is a movie, evolution. It doesn't stop. The story never stops. It continues to develop. You've got to be willing to stick with it, though. Mm-hmm. I love it. Um, I want to change, kind of change directions here a little bit. When you first started, and and even today, how did you how did you market your services? How did you market yourself? You know something, I, I because I've been a practicing attorney for uh, thirty years in the city of Chicago. I knew a lot of people, yeah. so. I, started reaching out saying, hey, look, uh, I am. And, and by the way, it became quickly apparent that public companies were not going to touch me. Mm -hmm. I have to answer to the shareholders, to the public. So mm -hmm. I immediately eliminated that and went for family businesses. Mm -hmm. And I would go to them and I would just I, I would pitch myself exactly like we're talking. I would go, let me tell you what your pain points are. And family businesses are great because they're so dysfunctional. <laughs> it didn't matter what I said, it was actually, it was actually spot on. For instance, third, third generation guy who founded the company doesn't want to give it up. Mm -hmm. Generation, first generation are moving and they want the authority and the power, right? So how are we gonna how are we going to to mediate this? Because I would put myself in a position as look, I can also be a facilitator. Mm -hmm. And and once somebody had me come in and meet with uh, the family, whoever that might be, uh, you were either gonna you were either I'm an acquired taste. And for a lot of businesses, family businesses, they enjoyed the no bullshit part. Uh -huh. They would be like, you're, you're going to be this honest with us too, because I would be like, here it is. They yeah. go, seriously? Yeah, seriously. I actually had the first one, uh, first, first time I went out. I, and by the way, I'm a preparer, so I prepared my spiel, right? So we got this whole interview process, but they never bring it up. Now, I know there's this thing called Google. <laughs> that, that you're going to know anything you want about me if you're willing to look. And obviously, if you're going to pay me, you're usually going to look. So I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. We get to the end of this thing, and uh, I forget who it was, but one of them said, by the way, how do you address, you know, your thing? And I, I looked at him, and I said, my thing? You mean my divorce? <laughs> and he was like, your divorce? I said, oh, you mean the prison thing? And he was like, oh, my. I said, they're about the same, aren't they? And by the way, attention disappeared and good to go. You've got to own it yep. before you can do anything with it. And I got to that point of saying, if I don't own this, I, nobody's ever going to, what are you supposed to tell you this didn't happen? Oh, my God, I walk in there knowing that you know that it happened. So I'm waiting for the appropriate time to say, hey, by the way, this is who I am. Uh, this is what I did. You already know that. And if that gives you problem, if that gives you agita, then you probably don't want me here. Mm -hmm. Curiously, being that authentic and vulnerable is the key. Yeah. That the connection. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than try to, you know, sweep it into the closet or something. Just... Oh, sure. Or, or try to do, you can't defend. How was I, what was I supposed to defend? I had two trials. I was in trial and then I was found guilty. I did five years in prison. By the way, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> you, you, they would have thrown me, they, the whole crew would have thrown me out. Stop it. Own it. I, you know, I, I, it, the, the concept of we pursue success and we run away from failure, mm -hmm. stupid. Mm -hmm. If your wife is in one of those two categories, mm -hmm. it, we we fail 50% of the time. Americans, 50% of Americans are going to get divorced. No one entered into that situation saying, I can't wait till we get divorced, honey. The second marriage fails by 76%. We're still doing it, right? And the third one fails by 60%. Oh my God, can we ever get away from failure? No, we can't. So let's stop trying. 
How about if you accept the fact that failure is a part of life, an inherent part of our DNA? And by the way, in failure is the seed for success, in success is the seed for failure. Mm -hmm. Unless you, everybody, if you, once you become successful, do you think you get to stop? Not if you're leading an organization, you don't get to stop. I think yeah, success is not a destination. But God, no. You don't reach success. Success is is what you practice every day, right? What you do, what you do at any point in time is what you do all the time. And, and you're you're spot on because it's an evolution, right? Success, your your success today has nothing to do with tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if you think that you know, there's there used to be you could be a one trick pony, do yeah. one thing, and it would last you forever. We're moving too fast for that now. If you're not continuing to reinvent yourself, be fresh, uh, be up to date, so that you can handle the problems and issues that are current. No, you're not going to be successful. You're going to fade away. Uh, by the way, I love people who say, well, I'm just going to, I, I will stay in my comfort zone. Your comfort zone is shrinking on you every day. <laughs> you can't run away from it. I'm sorry. If you don't want to go out and, and try to, uh, to, to do something, failure will come and find you. Mm -hmm. If you're being inert, you stop moving, you know, like what's up with the shark, you die. So no, so my contention is stop trying to avoid this, accept and own it, learn. Learn from success, but learn from failure. And understand that this is an ongoing cycle, that if you are moving ahead, being bold, you know, once again, I'm back to legacy. If you're going to be bold, you've got to be prepared to fail. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's part of being bold. Do do the thing nobody expects. Will it work? Hell, I don't know. Now let you can talk it through, but I guarantee you, you can control only what you can control, right? Mm -hmm. You accept what you can't control as a part of the package. Now, if this freaks you out, get out of the game. I tell people at some point, leaders need to get out, move, move out of the way, let someone else step into the role. Mm -hmm. So no, I and that and I, that that's how I lead my life, right? I mean, I can't I can't avoid my failures. And by the way, I learned I learned not to be a narcissist. How about that? I okay. went to prison as a narcissist. I I was the smartest guy in the room. Uh, and of course, you know, I'm in prison, so that kind of rang hollow <laughs> after after I was there. But for two years, I blamed everybody else for putting me in prison. Mm -hmm. And, and at the two year mark, I was shocked because when I had started my prison term, I met guys that were doing the end of theirs. Mm -hmm. they, then they came back. I was like, what the hell are you doing here? Well, you know, I, I got out and I went back and you know what? I just did what I was doing before because that's who I was. Learn. It is. And, and the environment was the same and, and they were the same and their mindset was the same. So guess what? They came back to prison and I was like, whoa, wait a minute. That's not going to happen to me. However, it was apparent at that point I had to do something so it wouldn't happen. And that right. was formation and change. Mm -hmm. When I reached out and asked people to give me the gift of truth and brother, did they ever. <laughs> Believe me, I heard stuff that I really was not happy here. By the way, I don't take criticism well. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and my wife had waited for 20 years to lay it on me. And in the visiting room, surrounded by 300 other inmates, she had something to say every time we visited. And at some point, I would like to I'd tell her, take a breath, because <laughs> I can only absorb so much. Don't yeah. worry. Don't make my head explode. Uh, and I would go away. pump the brakes. <laughs> exactly. I would go away and I would reflect. And she visited once a month for five years. She drove five and a half hours to spend two days in a crowded, unair conditioned visiting room. And we talked our way through this from year three on. Wow. And it was tra it was it was the necessity to change, to transform. And once I recognized that and the harm I'd done, because I ignored the devastation that I left behind. Mm -hmm. And and of course, I left 
financially destitute, uh, plus emotionally devastated. And my clients were, were all part of that damage. I mean, I just, I, it was like a bomb exploded. And I needed to bear responsibility for that. And I did not. I mean, I, I would not accept responsibility. I stood in front of the judge who said, if I accepted responsibility for my crimes, now remember, I've already been found guilty by a jury. He would knock 18 months off my sentence. And I refused. Wow. Yeah, you cannot get it. You know, the, the term is hubris. Yeah, that's a big that's a big ego that's getting in oh your way. Oh my life. god. Crazy, it just crazy ego, right? And that that was who I was then versus what I recognized I had to be to not come go back to prison. Sure. Because I, I would have definitely done that. I would have been back out associating with bad people and yeah. Then I would have gone. Yeah, either I would have been dead, or I would have been back in prison. Now, do you think you have to? You, the proverbial you, does 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 somebody, does anybody have to hit rock bottom in order to make that change? No. Or is it just easier that way because you've got no. you, you've you've yeah. been in the face, right? It's the old uh, uh, the Mike Tyson thing. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. That's a big punch exactly. in the face. Yeah, it was. And no, I don't believe that everybody has to hit rock bottom. I do believe that there has to be a seminal event for yeah. most leaders to suddenly realize the need to change. I think the pandemic is that event for most leaders. Mm -hmm. Those that are actually trying, trying to figure out what life looks like now, what the workplace, the work environment looks like now. Uh, some will make it, some won't, uh, but they are, they, they've been forced to do this. And they are starting to recognize there's a new list of leadership traits that if they're not going to do those, they're not going to be successful. Uh, the leaders will leave them and they're going to suffer from the competition. So I think there's been a wake up call for, and it's the industrial mindset that, that managed to prevail. Right? We started off with Know, being on the assembly line and, and that attitude that mindset is carried over into the office that doesn't work anymore knowledge knowledge workers will not accept that right the, the, it's always interesting when you look at these issues like work from home now if you can convince me that i can work better in the office with three hours of distractions on a daily basis because that's what it shows. It shows that the average office worker gets about three to five hours of actual work in because of all the distraction. Or I can stay at home and do eight hours worth of productive work. Why in the world do you have a problem with me being at home? Mm -hmm. Because I can't control you. That's mm -hmm. why 70% of employers are putting spyware on their computers. Mm -hmm. because and when we go back, I said it earlier, the relationship is based on trust. Every time you do something like that, you tell me you don't trust me. Yeah. And for leaders who don't understand that simple equation, they are not going to do well. In the new world. Yeah, it's uh, I believe I think Daniel Pink, uh, his book Drive. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one, but he talks a lot. Yeah, so I mean, he talks a lot about this and and, and having employees they they need equity and they need self sufficiency and and self authority and and all that kind of stuff and and if they have it, they are you know exponentially more valuable to a company than if they're being micromanaged. Yeah, because micromanaging means I will do exactly what I have to do to keep my job and not one thing else. Yeah, in discretionary effort. You said yeah. you buy it, you have to earn it. But once you have it, then that's when you need someone to step up. They do it without being asked. They just, uh, and the concept I'm seeing is, and I, a strong believer of self-directed teams, autonomous teams uh, that are going to be given the autonomy needed. So they set their own hours. And by the way, everybody understands that there's still a job to be done. I mean, no one, no one's saying this is a charity. Let's just play. Uh, but give them the task and as a team, they actually figure out how to do the task and they normally do it in a shorter amount of time and more effectively and efficiently than if they're being managed. Nobody wants to be managed anymore. Mm -hmm. 
Manny's, Manny's just leftover industrial mindset, mm -hmm. right? Stand in control. And we said, well, no, no, that went away. That wasn't, that's not my organization, really. Let's find out. And you find out that it's exactly your organization. Yeah. And it, yes, uh, the, the changes have started. I think they're strong enough just because the workforce has made some decisions about what they're willing to tolerate. That's why we have the great resignation. It has nothing to do with money. Yeah. Everybody always thinks about the money. I'm, they're, they're getting paid more. That's not why they leave. They leave because of their boss. They leave because of the toxic culture. Mm -hmm. Accept that and you suddenly see 50% of the resignations could be reversed and you would keep your talent. Well, and I think, I think that every person, every employee, every person, they have their own unique needs and desires, right? One person may just want the money and not care about vacation or autonomy. Another person may be fiercely autonomous and not really, really not want the micromanaging, right? Another person may want more time off of work and would be taking, they'd be willing to take less pay if they can get more time off work, so they can spend time with their family or whatever, right? And all of those things, I think on some, to some degree, at least it, it needs to be, um, looked at on an individual basis but but it doesn't take anything away from from what we're talking about here which is that people also need that autonomy well and, and what you say is absolutely true but it freaks the hell out of anybody in charge of an organization because sure. how do we do that how do sure. we how do we get and my deal is how how can you not do that uh, it, it seems to me that, and by the way, I understand you can't give everybody everything. I get it. Everyone knows that. But but the, uh, we're talking about the knowledge workers who know this. The, people have stopped being stupid. Mm -hmm. We force them to be. Mm -hmm. Force them to be stupid. But the, the normal situation is people are not stupid. They understand this. I, and what, a couple of other examples. Companies that found out that the employee that was working from home was doing a second job. Mm -hmm. Piss them off. I was like, well, wait a minute. Weren't they doing the job you gave them? Well, yeah. Did they do it well? Yeah. Uh, okay. So your deal is your, your level of expectations were so low that this person is either right. really good or not enough work. They can do it in four hours and now you're mad. By the way, let's get to the point of not paying for hours. Let's get to the point of paying for outcome, for results. Now right. we see something we can work with, yeah? But if you tell me, I'm just gonna pay you for X number of hours, you have to sit there for 50 hours and you've got the work done in 20? Come on, man, let's get serious about this. And yet we still are, st management struggles with that. Mm -hmm. uh, God, how dare they do that? Well, why wouldn't they do that? Mm -hmm. And they're not you, only in your own head, by the way. So, so all of this is now in the mix, right? And I love these hardcore uh, Goldman Sachs. I think several months back, they were like, everybody's coming back to the office. Everybody. Well, guess what? No, everybody's not coming back to the office. And you know what they've now done? They now are mandating everybody take vacation, right? So you've got to take it. Okay, good. By the way, window dressing. You know what I really want you to say? Everybody has to take their vacation. And when they do, they need to disconnect. Because mm -hmm. what will happen, they will work while they're on vacation. Right? So let's get serious and go, you can't work. But they haven't said that yet because they know their culture and they know that this group that's used to working 100 hours a week, uh, now only working 80, are going to take a vacation. They're going to work because they want to show the boss they deserve promotion. Mm -hmm. So we got candy coating stuff too, right? Pretending like we're giving something when in fact we're not. And that's what pisses people off. And uh, so, but by the way, they'll lose their talent. It's so good to hear it too. Yeah, yeah, this is this is great, Paul. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. I know we're coming up on the end of the hour here. Is there anything that we did not touch upon that you would like to chat about before we wrap up? No, I actually we've we've kind of done a real broad brush about things, but obviously things that I'm interested and passionate about. So I appreciate the opportunity to pontificate. 
<laughs> I love it. Beauty. Um, Paul Glover, uh, author of Work Quake. Where can people, where can our listeners and viewers connect with you online? Uh, first, uh, paulglovercoaching.com. Uh, and the email is paul at paulglovercoaching.com. And you can also hit me up on uh, on LinkedIn, Paul Glover Coaching. And I, I respond to every email, even the bad ones. In fact, I really like the bad ones. So if you don't like anything I have to say, make sure you let me know. <laughs> awesome. Paul Glover, uh, Workquake is available on Amazon. Check it out. Leave a fantastic review. Paul, thank you so much for joining us on the Market Approach Podcast. This has been a pleasure. Michael, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you and your audience. It's been a blast. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners and viewers as well. We'll see you guys next time. Cheers.